Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council meeting for the City of International Falls for Monday, November 19, 2018. I would ask all pleasant, present to arise in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would ask the city administrator to note the roll call with all members of the council present. We go to the agenda and we have um, a deletion of the uh, approving the travel and lodging expenses for the mayor to attend a meeting in Wilmer. Not going to do that. And uh, then we have additions to approve the Paul Bunyan Drug Task Force uh, Interagency Agreement. Also under uh, new business is to approve independent contractor agreement with Donald Kozak. Uh, item number five would be a resolution in support of legislative authorization for approval of the local sales and use tax. And item number six is a resolution approving the application for an exempt permit for the Chamber of Commerce to conduct a raffle for icebox days. Move the agenda. Motion by Councilor Jackson to approve the agenda with the addition and the deletion. Second. Second by Councilor Krause. Discussion on the motion or the agenda. None. Question. Aye. 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 Another vote. Yes. Motion is carried. Agenda is approved. Also, like to uh, this time uh, welcome uh, Councilor Elect uh, Leon Deach from the East Ward and Councilor Walt Buller from the West Ward. Congratulations on your election and uh, thank you for being here this evening. We we'll move to the uh, minutes of the regular City Council meeting of November 5th. I will mo make the motion to approve the minutes, Mr. Mayor. Motion by Councillor Jacksaw. Second. Second by Councillor Briggs to approve those minutes. Discussion on the motion or the minutes? None question? Aye. 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 I would vote yes. Motion is carried. Minutes for November 5th are approved. Item number two under approval of the minutes is the canvassing board meeting of November 13. Move. Motion by Councillor Kraus to approve those minutes. Second. Second by Councillor Jackson. Discussion? Question? Aye. 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 I would vote yes. Motion is carried. Minutes are approved. Uh, item three under approval of minutes is the special city council meeting of Tuesday, November 13. So moved. Motion by Councilor Droba to approve. Second. Second by Councilor Jackson. Discussion on the motion or the uh, minutes? Hearing none, question? Aye. 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 Vote yes, motion is carried. Those minutes are approved, thank you. And item number four under minutes is the committee of the whole meeting. And uh, that was also on Tuesday, November 13. I'll make the motion to approve those. Motion by Councilor Jackson to approve. Second. Second by Councilor Krause. Discussion? Question? Aye. 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 And I would vote yes. Motion is carried. And those minutes for the committee of the whole meeting are also approved. Thank you. Move to the resolution on transfers and payment of claims. We have three transfers. To the general fund from the water and sewer fund, $9,951.67. To the permanent improvement fund from the water and sewer fund, $62,500.
and to the reserve for capital outlay from the water and sewer fund $25,760.42. Counts payable claims the City of International Falls $538,351.44. Airport Commission claims of $10,786.78. And Library Board claims of $6,780.33. Council's pleasure with the uh, Resolution approving the transfers and the accounts payable. Move. Motion by Councillor Briggs. Second. Second by Councillor Jacksaw to adopt the resolution. Discussion on the transfers or the payment of claims. One question. Aye. 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 Yes, motion is carried. Approving the transfers and the payment of claims. Thank you. Move to the audience. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to bring something to the attention of the council that is not on the agenda at this time? If not, there will be another opportunity at the end of the meeting. we we'll move to um, public hearings. We have item number one is to remove from the table the first reading of the ordinance amendment section 3-5. So Motion by Councillor Jacksaw to remove from the table. I'll second. Second by Councillor Krause. Discussion? Question? Aye. 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 I'll vote yes. We have the ordinance amendment section 3-5. It is now before the council. So moved. Second. By Councillor Exxon. Second by Councillor Droba. So this would be the first reading of the ordinance, uh, and this would establish a uh, requirement that all water and sewer bills would be sent to the property owner. Uh, the property owner's name. There is a uh, process for that to uh, occur that's outlined in the ordinance amendment. I believe at, the, uh, at that meeting where we had uh, table, table this, um, we had uh, asked about the possibility of doing a, uh, sending both the property owner and the client that was uh, leasing or renting the facility, uh, sending them both a copy of the, and do we have an answer on that uh, at this time? What, if that was possible? To, to send both. Both the, the property owner and the uh, client if they're renting a, uh, understand yeah. but I think that was that was the question because I think at that meeting if I recall at least uh, the one property owner Jeff Wickstrom had uh, said that the city of Rainier does send them both a uh, both the client and the property owner a copy of the monthly bill or if it's in arrears by um, some several months that that would be uh, also noted on that bill and so that that is something that our system would allow or could do we could do the paperwork was helpful and others did not so full size duplicate
The administrator. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think to expand on, on Emma's comments, I think the uh, conversation that we had at a committee of the whole level was that um, staff was, was in fact discouraging having to do that because um, it's a considerable amount of work and time and effort and that's part of the reason for initiating this sort of amendment was to streamline the process to make the accountability for pass through water and sewer bills directly on the property owner because ultimately the property owner is responsible if somebody's delinquent in making payments and, and they leave the property um, we wanted to make it clear that it was the property owner's responsibility to make sure that their tenants were current on paying their water and sewer bills because ultimately the property owner would be held responsible when we assess the costs uh, towards the end of the year for the delinquent to the property owners and it's a amount of time for us to uh, and expense out of pocket expense to do mailings to both people was is that the city did not running landlords businesses the landlord should be in the business of running um, the system with a fair amount of labor and effort can um, be set up to send notice to both but I thought that the uh, general consensus of the committee of the whole was to I think that's true. I think that's uh, what the discussion was at the Committee of the Whole. I guess, uh, again, I'm, I'm uh, going back to the meeting. Now we've um, taken from the table to uh, consider the ordinance. And uh, I, I think we heard from a number of the property owners um, at that meeting. And I, b I believe they were um, all in one camp that they preferred to have the system continue as it as it was or send them a copy and they would deal with the client if they were in arrears um, and I think we were we were trying to as my understanding try to move away from having to have city employees go out and uh, hang notices on uh, uh, homes or uh, shut off water in some cases and so I I uh, just re recall the the discussions that were had at that time, yes, and and I guess um, I, I don't disagree with any of the uh, uh, discussion that we had there. Um, however, I'm not so sure that we uh, shouldn't consider the folks who are renting, the citizens who are renting these facilities as small businesses, and. Um, is there any any value in helping people in small business and that's why I'm thinking that possibly uh, sending them both a copy uh, or trying that system might be worthwhile but that's just uh, a question on my part further discussion with regard to the uh, first reading of the ordinance and the amending the Code of Ordinances establishing the requirement for water and sewer bills. I, I was of your sentiment earlier, but I have changed. I am now saying that we move ahead with billing the landlords directly. And the reason for that is um, the arguments that I heard really weren't that convincing when it came to why we shouldn't do that on the, the landlord's arguments. One of them was we don't want to take responsibility away from tenants. I th and the other one was it would be an inordinate amount of paperwork. A duplicate billing would provide just as much paperwork as doing a direct billing to the landlord. Um, just doing a duplicate billing. Further, they have means of of allocating that cost on a flat basis if they choose to do that and ultimately the bill becomes their responsibility should the tenant not pay anyway and so this just recognizes that from the get-go there are a number of cities who do this and all sizes it would alleviate some of the overhead in the department, which I think is a big, we spent an inordinate amount of time on uh, disconnect notices for tenants. 
And so it is a landlord business that's absorbing an inordinate amount of time of overhead in our administrative department. If we can reduce that by this process, I think that we're saving the rest of the water and sewer ratepayers money, and I, we need to do that. So, you know, we need to consider all the ratepayers. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Crows. In, nowhere in the ordinance does it say that the um, tenant can't pass it on and still have the, um, or the, the rent, uh, sorry, the property owner can't pass it on and have the tenant still pay it. So it's just that they're, rather than the bill going to the tenant, it's going to the property owner and they can still pass it along and say, pay this. And then if they get a, a notice that says they didn't, they have recourse against their tenant versus us by the time it gets to them. So I'm, I too am, I'm going to mimic your sentiment and I too am in favor of passing this directly to the, to the property owner and let them take care of it. Mr. Drova, please. Um, so, so here's my thought on it. I, I'm, I've been in support of this from the, the beginning, but I, I understand your concerns with, you know, especially when you bring up Rainier. Well, Rainier, all of their rental wouldn't be even a, a, a rational number to how many rentals we have in International Falls. The total amount of mailings for Rainier of all of their renters rentals might be $60. We're looking at $370 to $450 a month sending out dupli du duplicate bills. So I, I understand that that is a possibility, but if we're trying to do this as a cost savings, we have uh, three employees once a month that go out for two days to hang tags to um, find out if people are gonna come in and pay their water bill. If they choose not to pay their water bill, then we're shutting off their water, so we take another day out of our public works to, to do that. Um, I don't know what that number is, but I can't imagine it's less than $20,000 a year that we invest in, in uh, water bills. The vast majority of the water bills that we have to shut off that we're hanging tags are rentals. Um, ultimately, if those rentals are not taken care of, it goes on the property owner to the, to the business as it is uh, right now. So all we're doing is eliminating the step of shutting off the water. The last piece of this is if we're going to talk about rentals, let's talk about them all on the same page. Right now, um, we have one billing for um, South Falls Apartments. We have one billing for our uh, one of our trailer courts. They do all the billing because they are the landlord. So they, they incorporate that cost into the, what a unit would be or what the average fee is. So if we're going to do this, we're going with, I think it was Eagle's Nest. They have a population of less than 300 and this is what they do. And Fridley, Minnesota, which has 27,000 people. We're not, we're not doing anything that is completely off base from other cities. We're just trying to handle our business to be as, as economically feasible as we can be to our taxpayers because we know that we have in infrastructure problems in our community and when we're taking our people from public works to go and hang tags rather than to fix our potholes and shovel our, our uh, city streets, to, we have so many other things that we need to be focusing our time and effort for. And I don't wanna put any extra issue onto any of our small businesses because they are our small businesses and you're absolutely right. This is gonna be a hindrance for them, and I understand that, and I, I take that with, with a lot of grain of salt, but we have to do what's gonna be best for the vast majority of the citizens and the taxpayers of International Falls, and if we can cut 20 or $30,000 out of the budget just by fixing one little thing on how we bill our water, I know it's gonna make some people upset, but the reality is is we need to do that to move forward to be more fiscally responsible. So I, I definitely am in favor of this. I would just, uh, I think the, the um, example that was given at the meeting was that there was, uh, I think the month previous we had 44 water um, paying customers who hadn't paid their bill and that we had noticed them uh, uh, by hanging tags on their door 
and we're in the process of uh, moving to shut off some of them. And I believe it was about half of the 44 were rental and the other half are homeowners. Is that correct? And then the other uh, item that came up at the uh, committee of the whole meeting was that uh, the city of South St. Paul does not do shutoffs. And I think we were going to try to find out uh, from South St. Paul uh, what their uh, what their policy or process is. Yeah, and I looked into. City Administrator. Mayor, Council, I would just add that um, our street commissioner had spent a couple days um, working with the Public Works of St. Paul a year and a half, two years, actually it's probably over two years ago now. Policy is to not do the shutoffs and just assess the cost. Because of the trouble and the overhead and the investment of time and, and equipment and material that has to go into it. Not being able to shut off a service, a water service at a particular property. So that was their policy, but I can't speak to uh, what percentage of their customers fall into that category versus. Councilor Jackson. What Anna's getting at is that if we went that route, that we would end up with a, a lot more dollars being assessed to property than we have now which is a long delay between billing and collection and would depend upon if you know would depend upon the ultimate sale of the property in some cases until that lien can be collected right and you know There is no guarantee no. that the property taxes with the assessment are ever going to be paid as well. No, there's yeah. not. They get taxed for a bit. Yeah. So, so the sooner you can collect on a bill, usually the higher likelihood you have of collecting it. Yeah. yeah. If you can, you know, shut it off.
I would like to see the ramifications of delaying what we're not delaying now as far as uh, and the timing of those cash flows would occur so from the collection well, the, the uh, ordinance does have a second reading which would be at the uh, Council meeting in December the 3rd. So any further discussion with regard to the first reading of the ordinance? Hearing none, question. Aye. 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 I'll vote yes to uh, approve the ordinance. Oh. First reading is passed and uh, again, second reading will be December the 3rd. Thank you. We move to old business and we have a presentation by Mr. Scott Peterson of Minnesota Energy Resources, the natural gas uh, provider. Mr. Peterson, please. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Scott Peterson. I'm the Northeast Supervisor for uh, Minnesota Energy. So the Northeast region consists of uh, about 33,000 customers and 30 communities um, that we serve. Um, hopefully this gives you answers of what um, questions you are looking for, but I'm also open to, if you have a question, just interrupt and ask away. Uh, um, I have a question. Sure. Page, page four. Oh. Well, he asked, ask away, so I am He's doing what he asked. All right. I don't understand that graph because you don't have any, the colors there don't seem to make any so sense. So the, the brown colors are the service areas, the dark brown colors. Those are the areas we service as Minnesota Energy. Okay. It's not in your ch color code chart, but that's right there. Might have come out bad, but if you look, the brown square is service area. I'm looking at this. Okay. Page four, you said? Well, one, two, three, <laughs> four. It's page three. Page three. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> okay. So page three would be the also the. Uh, uh, Okay, I see the Minnesota Energy is the blue, but we're actually the brown in there also. Oh, we are the brown, okay. Yeah, in, in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor, excuse me. May I just say a few minutes? Thank you. Um, the reason why Mr. Peterson is here this evening is uh, <clears throat> the council had raised a question uh, a couple months ago when we were talking about the uh, uh, gas main explosion and the fatalities in the Boston area, as I recall. And so there were some questions about the status of our um, gas main infrastructure and so we raised some questions to the fire chief who wasn't at that meeting and he contacted Minnesota Energy and Minnesota Energy uh, um, ultimately had uh, Mr. Peterson prepare this information so that the council could get some background information on on their system, their services, and the condition of their system area. So that's why Mr. Peterson had a brief, brief background. So. Continue. Okay, so um, basically the, well, I'll walk you through a, uh, so if you go to page one is the uh, family of companies. So Wisconsin Energy Corporation um, is the owner of Minnesota Energy Resources, but they're also the owners of People's Gas in Chicago, North Shore Gas, Michigan Gas and Utility, and W Wisconsin uh, Public Service are their natural gas uh, distribution companies. Um, they also own uh, a vested share in blue water gas storage and then they also own uh, Upper Michigan Electric, We Energies, um, and then they have power generation. So um, those are kind of the family of companies that Minnesota 
energy is part of. Um, Wisconsin Energy on the second page. Just the focus of the fundamentals, it's safety, world-class reliability, operating efficiency, financial discipline, and exceptional customer care. Third page is the, uh, the regions that are served. So in basically all the colored areas are different uh, areas of our company. Our main concern, of course, is, is the uh, Minnesota end of it. Um, but in all, there's 4.4 uh, million customers in our corporation, 69,000 miles of electric lines, 47,000 miles of natural gas lines, and we got a power plant capacity of 8,600 megawatts. And I have, a, I want to ask a question then, since we're here. so the gas, I see we're alone, sort of isolated from everybody else in the area and receiving gas. So where do we get the gas from? Where? What's the source? That, and that's coming, but yeah, we get we get it from uh, Centra pipelines, which it comes out of where? Canada. I thought so. Okay. So Minnesota Energy um, as a whole, we currently serve about 235,000 natural gas customers in, in uh, Minnesota. We've got 224 employees. We serve 179 communities. And we've got about 4,800 miles of uh, main, five transmission lines, um, 76 BCF annually, and we're regulated by the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. On the next page, answer to your question, Cynthia, is uh, you see central pipelines up there, way up in the corner? Well, central pipelines dip down into Minnesota um, and then back out again, and then the pipe actually drops down. The feed comes across the Rainy River that feeds International Falls. So um, central pipeline is, is, uh, is currently the holding company in there, and I believe they've been in business the last 15 years, they have had some name changes in the last 15, I think. I think Energy Fundamentals Group is also a holder in that company. But that's just, uh, this page is basically a, a page of all the transmission companies that are out there. The lines that run across the United States, our corner of the world here. We go to page six, just a little information of where it all comes from. Um, it's pulled out of a well, goes into a processing plant, then into a compressor station, storage field, um, and a utility gate station. So the gate station for International Falls is right over by the border crossing and uh, Centra Gas owns the gate station and then out of the gate station is where the distribution system comes into International Falls. So, uh, which then goes down the mains into the homes from there. Um, the government oversight of our company, page seven, is the Public Utilities Commission, Department of Commerce, Attorney General's Office, and the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety. It is our integrity port. Uh, our initial system in International Falls was which is installed in 1971, um, which is considered a fairly new system compared to other parts of the country. Um, I believe you talked about the incident that happened prior. Um, their system in that kind of part of the country is over 100 years old. So, a lot different things. Um, the system in International Falls is 80% plastic, 20% steel. And our operating pressure is 59 pounds of pressure in our mains and services going to the homes. Um, the standard pressure testing, so like any new main we put in the ground, um, our service is tested to 150 pounds of pressure. So a main has a minimum of an hour test and depending on length can lead up to eight, eight hour test. So if we put a block of main in, that, would, that footage would require us an 800 pound test at 150 pounds. So it's got to hold that for eight hours. Page nine, um, the Office of Pipeline Safety, we have a 100 point inspection that's conducted every three years. Um, this year was the one uh, our audit 
MinOps audit was for International Falls, and we proved no violations. Um, so we spend basically three days with an auditor in the city, and they go over all of our records, and then they do a, we do a day and a half of field visits. So they just pick any site in town, and we go to that site. Um, basically uh, provide all of our records, our annual cathodic protection, our business district leak surveys, monthly odor, odorometer testing. So what odorometer testing is, is we have to test every, every month, four times a month in all areas of town, just for gas odor, to make sure that our gas stinks. Um, we want the public to be able to smell us at the, at the slightest sound of our faint of a leak. Um, we have internal crew auditing, um, emergency valve inspections, emergency procedures training and operator qualifications. Um, just a little bit more about that, our, our own crews, um, I believe you know Scott, Vic, them guys, they go through f about 52 training modules a year and they're required to uh, do some hands-on testing and then uh, computer-based modules. So every task they do, they have to prove they're sufficient in doing the task. So in the Northeast region, on page 10, um, as the region, we have about 5,500 yearly maintenance and safety check items, um, about 1,561 operator qualification modules and hands-on evaluations. We do about 665 odorizer inspections, 552 odorometer tests, um, 616 annual CP read, and that's cathodic protection, and 208 emergency valves inspections. Do you test schools every year? Schools? You do annual business district. Do you do annual yep. schools? So the, the schools, the schools, like a leak test inside the school? Well, I don't know exactly what oh, to So a business, what a business district survey is, if there's where you have a lot of pavement over the gas mains, we go out and actually um, survey those with what we call a flame ionization unit. Anything with hard surface like that, the gas would be tra trapped under that hard surface and want to migrate. So anything that's got green space, like grass or anything, the gas will go to the surface and escape. So like your downtown alleys, streets, things like that that are tarred over, we leak survey the building sides, the cracks, the anything looking for leaks. Um, every five years, the whole town is surveyed. And this year though, was the whole town survey for International Falls. So I think we had a few residents that called, said, you know, there's a white vehicle that's been sitting in the police chief's not in his head. You must have got a few of the calls Just a too. Couple. Yeah. What's, uh, what's this individual doing? Everybody's pretty vigilant on seeing what's going on around them. But that what was going on is, so every every main and gas service and meter got re surveyed in town here. So it's a walking survey. We walk over the top of the mains, the gas lines, everything looking for uh, any kind of uh, underground leak or above ground. So a leak that occurs in a green area isn't going to have the explosive power. It's not as much of a concern as a leak under a sidewalk or inordinate pressure in a pipe. Where's the risk? It's it's a leak under a sidewalk that can be exposed. I would say a leak that's tarred um, alley to alley. If you have a, because gas is gas is going to take the least path of resistance. Okay. So if you've got a tarred alley, building to building, and let's say your one of your buildings has a crack in the foundation wall. Well, the least path of re resistance would probably be that crack through the foundation or the cracks in the tar or whatever. So by leak serving that, with the flame ionization unit, we can pick up even the faintest uh, sign of leak. We also have, um, our billing does, is we also measure the gas that goes through the station and then all the gas build, okay? And they have to be in so many tenths of a percent of what passes through that station to what's built. So if there's a big 
rafters a lopsided and it doesn't fit into their percentile, which I don't know that number, but automatically that triggers some awareness. It's like, okay, what's answer your question yeah it does okay. and the the only reason I ask is I have smelt gas around the elementary school from time to time not lately but when I walk in that area and I have, have you called us at all no I haven't <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> that's why I'm asking what what's the I would I would if you smell what's the concern I mean yeah. you know I mean do you, you call smell gas yeah I definitely would recommend you to call okay well, I'm telling you now. The corner, of the, <laughs> so the, corner the the area that faces the college there, that corner in that playground area. But you know. Okay. Yeah. So what I can. But it may be gone now. But you know, I've smelled it. Well, and that's just it. If I send one of the guys out there now, at this point. I'm, yeah, you it's know, cold, right? No. What are they going to look for? I mean, is yeah. it? Well, it it was. What what I will do is I'll send Scott by there tomorrow. Yeah. And just have them pull around and check and yeah. see what we got going. I guess, and you can all laugh here, I guess, but the thing is, what's a concern? You know, I mean, is this any smell of gas a concern? Absolutely. I would say yes. Oh. If you're smelling gas, I would definitely appreciate a call. Okay. Because there's either equipment venting, and some of our equipment vents, it's doing what it's supposed to. Okay, so it could be normal. So we, That's we've got pressure relief all internal pressure relief center regulators so what that does is it opens that relief up so if it's sensing the customers pressure is getting too high it automatically exhausts the gas out of the regulator to save the customers piping it won't also won't over pressure so sometimes you'll get a whiff of that or even a furnace maybe not starting maybe it tries the light and it's failed so it's pushing raw gas out the exhaust you can get a whiff of it that way. But if you're smelling gas, to, just don't mess it. Yeah, it's easier, much easier to call us and let us in there and check it out. And uh, well, it won't cost anybody. We're more than willing to come and look. Okay. Another question. Our, our pipes are 50 years old, approximately, coming up on. Do you have a replacement schedule where you go in every so often and replace X percentage of the pipes? You know, there's certain different types of materials we'll replace. So um, right now there's an L delay replacement program Minnesota Energy is starting with next year. But nothing in the Northeast um, is under that plan, that age of pipe. Um, so they'll spend, last year we spent, or this year we spent $54 million as a company replacing mains. I guess one of the things that we made of came through here three years ago is we did all steel tube replacement. And the rock, approximately in the northeast, we spent about two million dollars replacing uh, uh, X tube. We call them services. And I, so they go with ranking and plans. So they'll they'll rank something and they'll go through it. I mean, what's your outer limit for pipes 100 years, or do you know? I, that's an unfair question maybe to you. That. For, um, put it this way, when, when we go down on a piece of pipe, let's say, we, so last year we abandoned a uh, service in the alley behind the bank there by our station, and the main line runs through that alley. Mm -hmm. So the process is, is they go in and they stop the pipe, so they'll stop and bypass, and then they'll cut the T out. So anytime we go down on a steel main and stuff, we inspect, and we do both an internal and external measurement on the pipe, just to make sure there's no internal corrosion or external corrosion. So every pipe that's in, steel pipe that's installed in International Falls is cathodically protected. So when you pull that pipe out of the ground, it looks like the day you put it in. Corrosion, anything wrong with it cathodics are doing their job. So, and how you test those cathodics is yearly test points. At a low reading, then you need to do something. Thank you. Uh, North Reach, so far as a region in 2018, when I wrote this, we did 
8,900 line locates. Um, our number one cause of pipeline failure is third party damage. That means somebody's cutting us with an excavator or um, maybe didn't call in a locate, things like that. Um, that is by far, by far our, our most threat to damage. Um, Gopher State One Call. Um, we conduct a yearly international fall sponsorship and we include ourselves, Central Pipeline, North Star Electric, and Minnesota Power. Um, one thing I'd like to do is take, take time with this too to invite the city to be a sponsor. Um, do you utilize One Call much? Yes, sir. We must. But it's, uh, the sponsorship last year ran about $200 a sponsor. But it's a very good uh, way to promote um, customer safety or citizen safety. Um, it's a free meeting. We invite all the contractors to it. We put on a presentation. Things like that. So it, it's it's a real good system to belong to. Um, slide number twelve is target zero. And um, it's a culture that and a mindset of thinking and believing that all injuries are preventable and a commitment to live and work safely every day and Target Zero is not a program, it's a way of living and uh, I will say so far in Northeast region of 2018 we are zero as a company. So, which is pretty huge with all the moving pieces we have. As far as our safety, we have a first responders training every three years. I think I was here with the fire chief last year in a presentation. It's conducted with our supervisors or managers. Um, we each go to each uh, community, talk about the characteristics of natural gas, safety procedures, and working together in the event of an emergency. Um, and the other piece is just a uh, brief map of, of our system layout. Uh, it's pretty small print. I didn't know how to make it any bigger, but I, I would ask that these don't get left laying around that we discard them after the meeting or something like that because it's um, information that we don't want the general public out there to have. It shows all of our valves, all of our, somebody with ill intent could. Yeah. That's about what I have. Any questions? Very good. Thank you. Uh, further questions on the part of the, uh, the council? So the one good thing about the International Fall System is we're operating at it's a 60 pound system. We, uh, the incident that's still under investigation that happened in the other areas, but what they were doing at the time is a pressure up rating. Um, so basically what they had there is they have a system with no regulators that was on a quarter pound and they were uprating the pressure for the mains to handle more capacity and for whatever reason when you start up in pressure and you push it right into a house, um, it's not a good deal. Um, I'm not sure all what happened there, but we're definitely not in the midst of doing anything. So you're alluding there was some negligence there, I'm hearing you say. Um, can't say for sure, I just know the process they were in when it happened. Chief Manasa, do you have any, uh, any comments you wish to make? Uh at this time? Uh, well, the only thing I'd like to say is uh, we have a very good working relationship with Minnesota Energies. Um, Dr. Ball, we do our every three years. They're all treat us very good and give us a good questions. And again, uh, with the full workforce, I, I think they're up back up to three guys now. Yep. Uh, again, we have a very good working relationship. When we have a gas line hit, they are very responsive and help us out. and. Uh, Thank you. I would just uh, share with you that in 1971, I was on the city council at that time, and uh, the uh, through the after World War II, uh, the 50s and 60s, um, natural gas was getting expanded uh, uh, all over the country. Um, there was no interest in bringing a pipeline up from the south, from the Twin City area up to International Falls. No one was, was no company was interested in doing that. Fortun fortunately, the, uh, the paper mill here, the one in Fort Francis and the one in Kenora, uh, owned by Boise Cascade, they wanted to eliminate uh, 
uh, utilization of coal uh, in their furnaces and uh, moved to a cleaner fuel of natural gas. And so they were able to uh, secure a gas company uh, from Winnipeg, uh, I don't remember the, the name of it that, uh, today, but uh, they, they brought the line from Winnipeg on the Canadian side, crossed the International Bridge, and, uh, and then served the, the mill here, and then expanded into serving the community in the early 1970s. So that was uh, very helpful to this community to be able to get uh, gas from the Alberta uh, gas fields to our community. And well, in 2019, um, um, Center Pipeline is going to be redoing the feed. And you might have seen some activity happening there. They're replacing the pipe on the bridge. And they're also going to be redoing the town border station. What that's going to do for us is right now, Minnesota Energy, we're on chart basis. So every week, Scott goes out and changes his charts so we can watch our pressure, make sure everything was fine. Um, but it's going to give us real eyes on the system. So we'll, we'll have electronic eyes and, and gas control will actually be monitoring the gate station. Bonus for us. I mean, as a supervisor, I, that's something that's really welcome. Thank you. Councillor Droba. Well, I was just going to make the point. I, I, I believe that the reason we invited you here tonight is to, to make sure that everything is safe and up to snuff. And I think that the information that you provided definitely shows that with all the checks and everything you guys are doing. And I, I didn't really feel unsafe before we asked you to come, but I feel considerably more safe since you've been here. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here, Mr. Peterson. Yep. Have a good evening. One more thing I wanted to add. Please. We do have a conservation improvement plan and a 4U2 program. So what that means is um, anybody putting in new boilers, furnaces, things like that, we have a rebate process for them. So if your schools, um, any of your city, bu city buildings are doing any revamping, there's considerable dollars out there to be had. Um, there's also the 4U2 program is for your residents. And a family of three can make $65,000. And if they're under that, they qualify. If, say their furnace goes out and it's totally shot, they qualify for a free furnace. So it's something that uh, I just wanted to make relevant out there that you guys know about it, because sometimes we all run into situations. So. Sure that's okay. well, very, very helpful because I think we'd be replacing the uh, the furnace in the library building. I think is on on schedule, so uh, that will come in. Definitely get all. You know Pam's number, so get all the Pam, and she'll work with you on that. Actually, Katasca should be notified of the uh, subsidies for people that are under a certain income level. That would be something they should know because they work with heating and. Okay. Thank you. We'll move to the uh, consent agenda and uh, two items under the consent agenda is the approval of the 2019 license renewals for Cater for You LLC, an itinerant restaurant license, city cab and van service incorporated, a taxi license, duty free America, gasoline pump license, Huffaker Lawn and Snow Service LLC, snowplow license, Posh Relief LLC massage individual license. And then we also have the uh, Paul Bunyan Dr Drug Task Force Interagency Agreement under the consent agenda. Council's pleasure with the consent agenda. Both. Motion by Councillor Briggs to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second by Councillor Droba. Question. Aye. 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 Yes, motion is carried. Consent agenda is approved. Thank you. We move to uh, new business. Item number one under new business is the Rainy River Community College Health Care Initiative and Funding Plan. Dr. Kelly. Danita. Rob. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to talk standing up for a moment and then I'm going to sit down and let the people who are important talk. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Roxanne Kelly and I'm the provost at Ray River Community College. I've been there for about 16 months now. 
Um, and it was my pleasure to learn that we had a nursing program and because I was a nurse in my first career. So LPNs are near and dear to my heart as are RNs, my sister and my stepmother both are RNs. So nursing is in our family. Um, we have the nursing program by the grace of our partners in our community and you see three of them as well as the city and Keita and the county. Uh, we are at nearly at the end of our original partnership time, which was three years. What we want to talk about tonight is a little bit of the history. We'll talk a little bit about where we are in our funding structure for the next year and following. And talk about what we need in order to keep providing what our community partners need and our community as a whole um, requires from the nursing area. So um, I'll let our folks introduce themselves, we'll start with Anita, and then we'll go to our partners and go from there. And I'll be happy to answer questions if any of you have any of me later on. So, um, Danita. Uh, Danita Adestad. Um, I am Nursing Faculty Healthcare Program Director at Rain River Community College. Rob Haster, I'm the CEO at Rainier Lake Medical Center. Uh, Zachary Schmitz, Administrator at Good Samaritan Society. I'm the Administrator at Christine Health Service. So I want to start just with a little bit of a reminder of how we came to be where we are today. Um, for many years, our community benefited from the nursing program at Rainier River Community College. I was a product of that, as are most of the nurses that are in our community. Um, about 2014, as Chief Nursing Officer at Rainier Lake Medical Center, I started to notice that we had a decrease in applications for our open positions. Uh, we started to advertise further out, um, use some online forums, etc. And we did get a few more applicants, but they were not local. So what I found was that they would come here and uh, get their experience and then return after a year back to the cities, um, which was very costly by the time that we um, trained them, et cetera, had to re-recruit. We also experienced um, some shortage in healthcare workers on the other side of the table as far as our patients and their um, discharge status. We had patients who needed to go to long-term care and when we would do the referral over to the care centers, they were not able to accept our patients because they didn't have enough nursing staff to provide care. So that resulted in us sending patients um, to long-term long care facilities hundreds of miles outside of our community away from their family. So in about October of um, 2015, <clears throat> excuse me, Kita contacted the college, asked for some representatives to come to a meeting and explain what was going on. And so uh, what they discussed was that there was a change in accreditation requirements and also in uh, educational requirements for nursing faculty. So it was decided that the college would no longer have a nursing program, but they would do a partnership with Itasca Community College. And that meant at that point we had an online program. There were six students and then there was a local uh, faculty who would instruct in clinical. So they did not have a full-time person um, in the classroom or on campus with them. And those six students were a little bit vocal about their displeasure with the program um, and the way it was being ran. So uh, it was decided to have a community forum, invite the local healthcare organizations. They did a panel. Uh, they had breakout sessions and a lot of discussion. And it was determined in order to get the nurses back that we need in the community, they needed to have a full-time faculty member uh, on campus at all times to mentor the students and then also to recruit and um, bring more, generate more interest in the healthcare field. So a partnership, private and public, was formed uh, who committed financial funding um, to help with that position and then that coalition applied for a USDA grant and received that grant for the year, first year. So that's where we're at with budget and where we are. So if you'd like to pick up <coughs> sure. the budget piece. So um, in your packet I believe you have our budget projections for the 2019, which is our fiscal year 20 and July of 2020 years, have been frugal uh, over the last few years. Of, you know, but we have a decent carryover. So we'll be carrying over about a little over $82,000 for next year. 
The program typically costs us nearly $200,000 to run. So moving forward, um, <coughs> see that we have had $20,000 a year, every year for three years from um, Rainy Lake Medical, <coughs> City of International Falls, Kita, and Essentia. Good Sam was a partner the first year and uh, did not continue that um, financial support, but has continued support of our nursing graduates and as a clinical location. Our USDA grant was for one year of $90,000 and we have had an ongoing um, grant for equipment that we do not know if it will be funded another year. But we do have very good equipment. <laughs> we have really good equipment. So starting in July, this coming July, we will have $82,000 on our books. And if no one donates anything, provides any financial support, and we stay fairly steady, and this is all given with the idea that um, our tuition will not be allowed to go up, the number of students will remain about the same. Um, Anita's <coughs> salary will go up by about 3% that that is part of the con contracted. It squeaked by, but a deficit of $1,000 at the end of the year. So you'll see that that continues and just worsens over the next year. So by the end of June 2021, we will have a problem with um, needing a great deal more. So what we're asking is, um, just letting you know where we are financially, we, we can certainly... Moving forward, we want to talk about what the program brings to the community, what we provide to our partners, and then kind of let you know what would be really helpful for us moving forward as far as financial support. Not only the moral support that you give me, give us all the time, because you do, but a financial support as well. Um, just to give you an idea. So I'll turn it back to these guys to talk about what we provide and what the benefit to the community is. Um, before I let um, the partners uh, explain to you a little bit, I do want to let you know that we have currently then we have LPN students and when you look at your budget you'll see that there is a space in there where um, we have RN students through Hibbing Community College and so that appears. The first year that I was on board in um, 2016 we did not have enough applicants to do an RN cohort. Uh, the next year we had 17 applicants and since then we have um, had another um, cohort this year also. So uh, that, you know, it's never a guarantee but it feels pretty good when I, my LPN students are wanting to go on. So I think that looks pretty positive. So just to let everyone know that we are educating and this is rather unique. Um, that we're able to do it in our community, that we are able to educate LPNs and RNs, and they have that opportunity to stay in their home community and receive the support here. So, do you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, so I mean, workforce shortages in healthcare are going to continue to be an issue. Um, I think because of where we're at and because we're isolated, probably even that more, much more. Um, being creative and kind of thinking outside the box, uh, we're getting ready to go to strategic planning with our board. And one of the ideas that I, I would like to float is, do we have to, do, to develop a grow your own program? And what that means is, are we going to pick employees of ours who may be in a different field uh, that we feel are doing a good job who maybe want to be a nurse? And can we support that? It's much easier to do if we have a campus here that we can do that. If we have to start talking about sending people 90 miles away, there are a lot of... Uh, a lot of things that happen with that, number one, they won't be able to work more than likely. Number two, sometimes people go away, they get comfortable where they're at, and they don't come back. So I think there are benefits to having the program here in town. Um, I would, as of right now, I think we've got about three openings. We actually did just contract with a uh, headhunter to find us a house supervisor position that's been open for about 12 months. You need, um, you know, working with Roxanne, I think there's some other things uh, internally maybe we can look at too. Uh, one of the challenges I see is sometimes requiring somebody to be an LPN before they can get into the RN program. Some conversations w about that, and I feel like they're open to looking at that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, kind of like uh, actually the program Rob's talking about, we kind of have that already with our employees who want to be uh, become a CNA. And actually, right now, I can probably think of about four, three or four employees that want to go through that class. 
Um, and they're currently not in clinical, they're not in a nurse or a CNA, but they want to um, transition from, we have housekeepers that want to go into that kind of realm, um, and that class would provide that. Um, and on the other hand, you know, the community college does provide us with a lot of our nursing staff, uh, primarily, um, you know, a lot of our LPN CNAs come out of there. Um, and you know, and now that I've only been here, you know, since the beginning of October, so for me personally too, not just also for our um, facility, but it'd be great to see this program um, continue with this community college because I think a nursing program in any um, college is very um, is very beneficial, especially when a town like this has a lot of health care uh, for this for what it is. Um, and also just the fact, you know, our staffing is a challenge for us too. Um, it's one of the biggest concerns on the plate right now. Um, you know, and we're doing everything we can, um, being creative to try to hire uh, staff and get them to uh, stand in the applications. And, um, you know, keeping that around, um, you know, would help with that. And also just our residents we care for, for, you know, they've been a part of this community for their whole lives. and. You know, in order to provide them, uh, with, you know, the best care that they should receive, and that really comes from having adequate staff for them. You know, and uh, this program really helps with that. So, I think they both hit the mark by saying that growing your own is exactly where it's at, and we want to be able to continue to do that in our community. They don't have anybody better in the community to pull all that together than Danita Edstead and Rainy River Community College. Um, without that at the helm, pulling people in, recruiting people, getting people interested, the program could be there, but there may not be the applicants, there may not be the students, and we, you know, it's a business for them too. They need to have the numbers to be able to run their programs, and um, without somebody there pulling and drawing those students, then it's vital. Otherwise, it, it just absolutely wouldn't happen, and I don't know if you see what's going on in the paper, but we're all competing for the same pool of staff, and it's painful. And you know, the prices go up, and the bonuses go up, and the creative ways of getting people in your doors is just, you know, mounting. And so, really, it is important for us to draw people into this healthcare. Um, hmm? There, uh, I'm so nervous. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Doing great. You're not a trial. <laughs> the healthcare community. I mean, we really desperately need. Folks, and um, I can't say enough about keeping the program going in the community. I've had an RN um, position in the paper for, well, on and off for, I've needed a full time RN for a year or more. And working in long term care is not glamorous. People aren't knocking down the door to come and take care of elders, and it's unfortunate because we're all going to need that care or know somebody who does at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just to give you an idea of what we've put out over the last two years um, as far as students, there is a cap at 10 students for one clinical instructor. Um, so, in uh, 2017, uh, the first class that I graduated out, we had six LPNs and no RNs at that point. And then last year, which was our second year, um, we had six LPNs and six RNs that graduated out. This year, I currently have five LPN students and nine RNs. Um, currently employed to look at the financial impact. Um, currently employed in our community from the last two years are four LPNs, uh, three LPNs at Ray Lake Medical Center, three RNs at Ray Lake Medical Center. Um, and so financially we've, we've put out 14, 14 nurses who are currently employed in the community. So looking at um, their salaries that they would be receiving, it's almost a half a million dollars is what their, um, their salaries are that they're bringing in and putting back into the community. And if in June we graduate out um, those LPNs and four non-duplicated RNs, it'll be close to another half a million dollars of salaries. So that's quite a big impact that we're having that um, here locally that staying here that are here during their getting their education and not having to go somewhere else and taking the risk of losing them. I have a lot of um, moms with children that are in the program. Uh, they get uh, nice support um, emotionally um, from coming into the class and so uh, I think that I also looking forward to my RN class in 19 I think we'll probably have about nine students again. So. 
the challenges that I think everybody is facing is the retention of the so um, as Denise said early on if we have people here they very often will come to get the very basic You know that's a challenge that they that all of our partners face is to get people here and keep them here. That's what our county and our, our city are facing, and, and keep the youth. Many people my age and older, but we're not who we want. Younger folks. We want younger folks. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that really is a challenge. It's a challenge all the way around. We face it at the college. why I think the partnership the partnerships are so important and for us to look outside the box to see what we can provide that we haven't provided before uh, as Zach came in tonight we just had a very brief conversation about um, adjusting some of our scheduling so that we meet his needs Bob and I have done the same thing and that's something that's important for us to do and as Carrie said Donita really is the heart of all of this without her and her constant presence in the community her relationship all of the partners and her relationship with the school, our program wouldn't be successful. The one thing I have to interject though is that it is cost prohibitive for us as a college at this point in time to own our own program. That's the one thing I program back. We have wonderful partnerships with ITASCA and with Hibbing. They're working beautifully the students, we can the very best instructors possible. So, and we bring money back into the community to support and the tax base increases. So those are all the things that we want to do. That's how we want to move into the future without everybody's help. We are um, preparing letters to go out to all of our partners asking for um, future us continue the program. Uh, I don't think Danita is going to work for free. I don't think she's going to work at a reduced rate. Bob is thinking, hmm, I have some positions open. Which don't get it in. <laughs> so um, with your help, we can keep this going. With everybody's help at this table, we can keep this going. So um, given that, you have our financial status. Um, you have our estimates, and I would ask that you consider to questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Questions by the council? Very good presentation. I paints the picture really well. Well, I do have. Denise, do you do you turn anybody away because uh, you know you you don't have the staff or no, are so, we to that stage yet? That no. So um, as Roxanne talked about, that if we had our own program, <clears throat> we would definitely need more instructors, and our instructors have to have a master's degree in nursing, and. Usually if people have master's degrees in nursing, they've gone in to be a nurse practitioner because that's what they wanted to do. I got my master's because I wanted to teach. It's what I like to do. Um, so to do our own program requires some different things. But as far as my applicants that I'm getting right now, there are requirements. They have to have, um, there's an entrance exam that they have to pass at like a 50%. And the reason that's there is to help them pass their licensing exam um, afterwards. So if they don't pass that exam, which I have one gal right now who's working on getting it passed, Past. She's studying. I'm helping her, trying to figure out how to get it done. So we have not had to turn people away. I've had people who I thought I had 10 nursing LPN students at the, in May. Come August, I had five. And I don't know what happened to them. Well, a couple of them moved. Um, one felt it was too stressful for her to do. One hadn't passed the entrance exam. Another needed a, another um, class. So there's things that happen. Um, but... I get very energized when I have students who are coming in or calling, and that's happened. 
at least every other week there's somebody who's saying, hey, I'd like to go into nursing, what can I do? And I think that the journal has done a really nice job with publicizing things, getting stuff out there, and it makes people think. And that's what I would like to do, is people who are in our community who didn't think they had an opportunity to do this, um, now do. So. And we're lucky at the college that we're able to provide the wraparound services for those folks who need a little support to get to where they need to be. So we have advisors that will help. We have instructors that are very helpful. And that's really kind of our hallmark, is that we have And sometimes they find out that nursing might not be it, but a CNA might be exactly what they wanted. Or they might want to go into um, medical lab instead. All of those different options, but we have the wraparound services that help them. I was just curious, do we get many folks from across the river that enter the program? I know they're short over there, too. Yeah, so. Right. Um, in the past, I would have one or two students, but I haven't for a long time. Uh, they do have a nursing program across. Uh, I did have a person who called about the RN program, and what they need to do is talk to the Ontario Board of Nursing and find out what they need to do to challenge that exam. So, yeah, limited with that. And one thing I do want to add, because there was a concern, you know, that we are um, educating LPNs and RNs. And so the fear was there that these LPNs would go back to RN school and then we wouldn't have enough LPNs. But what's happening is they are working while they're back in school. There's like five out of the um, nine students that are working as LPNs while they're in school. So, you know, just to be reassured that that's, it's a load that they're taking on, but they get some good scholarships too while they're doing that, so. Yeah. Well, and we're very fortunate to have a beautiful facility that oh, provides yeah. that. And I, it was certainly highlighted when uh, Senator Franken was here and, and uh, toured uh, the campus. And the same, and, and to complement that, are the beautiful facilities that we're doing our clinicals in. I mean, it's state of the art where they're um, in the lab or in the clinical site. So we are very lucky. Another question would be for, for you. Are, are we. A long ways away from the numbers that we would need for you to take that on as a program and not need our help, or are well, we you know, reaching out there? This, we're, we're you know within ninety thousand dollars of sustaining, but that would mean we need enough students every year. Positive of ninety thousand. So, budget. You know, I got to look at the numbers, but I'm thinking two hundred fifty thousand dollars of revenue in order to meet. That's what, as the equipment ages, we'll have to change things. But, um, I would say, in the partnership with the two other colleges, we are limited in the number of students we can take. The number of faculty here, we have just one, one full time, and that's just hard pressed to go much larger than 10 and 10. Start with 13, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we would be in pretty good shape, but we probably will need some support from some. We are looking, we look for grants, and we will reapply for the um, USDA one this year again. So, this is a question just as to how you deliver your education when you have, when you're partnering with Itasca. Mm -hmm. Do you do teleconference? Is that what you do? Yeah, All yeah, yeah. So we have some really nice large screens that um, they either Skype in, now they're linking in, but yes, so that it's projected there. And then- so Students aren't traveling. Correct, uh, correct. They go down, they didn't go down at all to Itasca this semester, but next semester I think they go once or twice down there is all they have to do. And then the same with Hibbing. We have the same situation, telepresence with Hibbing, and maybe a trip or two down to the campus, but otherwise it's all here. Councilor Krause. Yeah, uh, Dr. Kelly, you had mentioned that there's a tuition freeze. I see, it's just crunching some numbers. 20565 is that's Rainy River's contribution to the program out of the student's tuition that they pay directly to Rainy. Uh, nursing tuition, second from the bottom, right above leveraged equipment there. 
Um, tuition comes in, it doesn't come in to us. A portion of it will come to us for the classes that they have that are wraparound classes. Sure. But because we don't own the classes, Hibbing and Itasca do, that's where the tuition goes. Okay. There's some billing back and forth between us and Itasca and us and Hibbing so that we are compensated for part of it. And that's, that's also in here, but it's the back and forth. But the majority of the tuition will go to the two other colleges. They have the majority of the students. I'm sorry? Because they have the majority of the students. Right. So those are the and rounds. they so carry the all but one the instructor no, 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 no. on their payroll. Do you feel that deal is fair? I do. I, I just reworked one last, geez, I don't know, when did we redo Hibbings? This well, summer. This summer, not that long. Um, and it's very fair because they hold the accreditation. They make sure that they have a director of nursing, which is very costly. Um, they make sure that we have all the infrastructure that we don't have to have. And Donita gets, we, we, com we are compensated for part of Donita's salary, you know, those kinds of things. Um, it's as fair as we can get at this point without, without going way into debt owning our own. If I didn't think so, um, I would be fighting very diligently to get more money from our partner. Sure. I just I wanted to make sure because I'm you know it's looking like what about fifty six six is what you're pulling between the HCC reimbursement and then your fiscal year uh, appropriation. So that makes sense, but it only covers about a third. About a third. So it's a, a pretty big town. chunk here. Excuse me. No. We're a small town, remote. Uh, the college is very important to this community. Oh, I've always felt that Rainy Lake, Met, uh, Rainy Lake River Community College. So it's like Rainy Lake Medical Center. It's an essential piece of having a full community. So I thank you for your service and for your successful effort here. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll expect your letter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'll hand deliver it. Three doors down. Alrighty. Thank you. Great report. Move to item number two under the uh, new business, and that's the approval of the 2019 license renewals and. Uh, those include uh, Freedom Value Center, 3-2 off-sale license, cigarette, fireworks, gasoline, and restaurant license. Freedom Value Center number 62, uh, similar 3-2 uh, off-sale, cigarette, gasoline, restaurant license. Riverfront Bar and Grill, on-sale liquor license, jukebox license, restaurant license, and Sunday liquor license. Timber Pins, LLC, an on-sale liquor license, restaurant license, bowling alley, Sunday liquor, and pool table license, and Veterans of Foreign Wars, Peter Graham, post number 2948, a pool table license, club license, gambling license, restaurant license, Sunday liquor license, and jukebox license. Your pleasure with those uh, renewals. Move. Motion by Councillor Jackson to approve. Second. Second by Councillor Groba. Discussion on the motion or the licenses? I just want to let, let you know that I'll be abstaining because of being the financial manager for the VFW. All right. Thank you. Further discussion? Is the question? Abstain. Aye. 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 I would vote yes. Motion is carried for, for the motion and one abstention. License is approved. Thank you. Move to uh, item number three, and that's uh, resolution approving the increase in the International Falls Fire Rescue EMS Department ambulance service rates and fees effective January 1, 2019. So moved. Motion by Councillor Jackson. Second. Second by Councillor Briggs. 
discussion on the resolution or the ambulance rates and fees? I'd just like to state that we hired a consultant. We put a lot of work into this and thought this is a well thought out proposal. We have to do this. Uh, we're being responsible in raising these rates. I want to thank Chief Manasa for working on the, uh, you know, working on getting Metro up here and all the time the council spent meeting with our consultant. I think this was a well thought out in depth proposal that he put forward and that we tweaked a little bit. Okay, further discussion? Councillor Krause. Just like to note that the uh, the initial table was only, it, it was, it had nothing to do with the proposal as written and it was just to give us. Everything that <laughs> Councillor Jackson said is, is true, so. Unfortunately, we do have some financial stresses that the whole medical system, the whole, the whole nation is having stress with ambulance service, so we're not alone up there. But this will not solve the whole problem for us. And when I listen to the college about their stresses, I, you know, we have a half a million dollar deficit in the ambulance department right now and really no clear way as to how we're gonna pay that back unless we take it out of property taxes. So it's a tough situation we're in and part of the problem, if I'm incorrect in saying this, please correct me, but part of the problem is the Medicare discounts. So, you know, we Medicare don't really get our full billing in the first place and so, um, we have a lot of it's also important for our constituents to know that uh, you know when we took on the paramedics and got into this you know full-blown ambulance service we were new at the game and really didn't know what the rates were supposed to be to to keep ourselves above water you know so far as being in the selves in the black and uh, we got so far behind that you know it was important that uh, the chief came up with Mike Metro to get him here and consult with him so that we really had an expert opinion on where we really needed to be and where to go with our rates. So, well, and, and if I could, uh, just to expand on what Councillor Briggs said, it's not like we were off base on our pricing. We were we were average pricing for any other community, and and it was pointed out that we were average to other range cities, we were average to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and metro areas, but we have something that they don't have, distance. We, we have to, we don't transfer a short period, a short distance. We transfer 150 miles every time we do it. And that makes a considerable difference when you're talking, one of your, your EMTs leaves International Falls at the beginning of their shift, and their shift is over when they come back. You just had one per, or two people, their entire shift was doing a transport to Duluth. And sometimes it's to the cities and now we have overtime on top of that. So the reality is, is we didn't have bad rates. We had rates that were not sustainable for rural Minnesota. And I think that that's the most important thing that needs to come out. Virginia goes 60 miles to Duluth, we go 165 miles. Right. Yeah. One way. <laughs> I mentioned the wear and tear it's putting on our on our rigs, and it takes. We've only got so many rigs, and it takes the rig and the crew completely out of the area for the in, for the duration of their shift. So very good. And the increase uh, rates are all listed on Exhibit A of the uh, resolution. Further discussion. All those in favor of the motion to uh, let, call the question on the resolution. Aye. 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 Yes. Motion is carried. Resolution approving the increase in ambulance service rates and fees is approved. Thank you. Item number four under new business is to approve a contractor agreement with Don Kosak for uh, work with the, our IT business. Uh, 
And City Attorney uh, Don will be here next week working with the the, the system and the, the new uh, employee? Yes, Mayor, Council, just for a little background information. Uh, this is just an independent contractor agreement with Don Kosek, who's our former employee, to uh, train and work with our new employee on our service systems, networking, and uh, kind of show them the lay of our, our system here, um, working with the law enforcement center and other parts of our facilities. So uh, he's anticipating being here on uh, Monday the 26th and Tuesday the 27th. Uh, we were actually hoping to have him here uh, this week, but plans changed. And so this is a standard independent contractor agreement. There's a model uh, form of this agreement that the League of Minnesota have adapted it for this use to assist us with um, um, our information systems administrator training and work. And uh, the city has reviewed the agreement and thought it looked fine. For your pleasure with the contractor agreement? I'll make a motion. Motion by Councillor Krause to approve. Second. Second by Councillor Briggs. Question? Question. Aye. 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 And I would go yes. Motion is carried. Contractor agreement is approved. Thank you. Item number five under new business is a resolution in support of the legislative authorization for approval of the local sales and use tax to finance transportation and public infrastructure projects. So moved. Motion by Councillor Droba. Yes, second. Second by Councillor Kraus. This resolution will, uh, will go to our legislators, uh, Representative uh, Rob Eckland and uh, State Senator Tom Bach. Um, I had uh, discussions with uh, Senator Bach this morning and uh, he believes that he'll be uh, here in the community uh, with um, the county board and uh, uh, any others that want to meet and he would include us uh, making sure that he has time to sit down with us. As a former uh, committee chair of the tax committee he will be helpful in giving us suggestions on how we might uh, move forward and, and what we might uh, present to the uh, uh, legislature uh, when that time comes. So um, that will probably happen uh, the first uh, week or two of uh, January. Mr. Mayor, Please. you were going to meet with the mayors earlier, but you're not going to make that meeting. That's correct. And if you get my take my report on the second page, I got three paragraphs outlining. I, I spent time with the, the state senator from uh, Wilmer, okay. and uh, he outlined, as did uh, Senator Bach today. And uh, I didn't get to talk to Senator Bach until after one o'clock, but. Um, each community is going to have to make their own case. They're each a special uh, legislation, special law, and and working together, collaborating is not going to be of any real value. Is what he said. You you need to make your case, and so uh, and Senator Lang thought that we had done very well in uh, having the studies done by uh, professional engineers outlining what the uh, estimated cost. Um, as you note in the uh, in there, he did kind of uh, raise his eyebrows uh, when I told him that we were looking at 30 million in 30 years. That he had not seen one for 30 years um, uh, previously, and so uh, he just kind of raised his eyebrows about not the, the amount, but the time. <laughs> Correct. Um, Wilmer is going for 30 million over 17 years, but they're able to raise several million right. in in their uh, with, with their population in the outlying areas there. We're going to get it. Mayor, please. I, I would just add for information purposes is that in addition to the resolution that you've identified and and the comments that you've made, uh, we did include in the packet a copy of the actual. Uh, legislation that's been drafted by our uh, by Briggs and Morgan, which is a law firm that's been assisting us. Actual special legislation is attached as the last page in the 
By the way, I'd like to take this opportunity, if I may, Mr. Mayor, to thank our city administrator who really did put all the parts together, contact all. Yeah, you did. You did a yeoman's Il job on organizing this. So take the credit when it's due. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of parts to this, and it's a compliment to you to hear that we really did our homework so well in laying this out. Yeah. It's a compliment to you that we did our homework. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Please, will this be something that you will uh, make a trip to the cities to and the lobby? And, and I know Councilor Droba wants to be a part of that uh, uh, effort also. So uh, we'll certainly be uh, sitting down talking with uh, State Senator Bach and what he sees uh, uh, that has to put forward uh, when we do that. But we certainly are going to highlight uh, uh, what our professional engineers have outlined for us in terms of need. And that's why we are seeking the amount and the time to, uh, because we're, we're only looking to raise approximately 800000 a year, over 30 million, to even hit $30 million. I would, would hope that you'd also be able to make comment about what's happened in the community in the last so many years with the... Uh, uh, is he shutting down and uh, build right possibly while it's down and all the other things that have happened around here that uh, the tax base has gone way down and the fact that you know, we just can't uh, run ahead of the game without this. And, and Senator Lang really uh, uh, felt that the uh, going for infrastructure needs that we prove that, that there's a need there Hearing uh, the engineering firm to come in and diagnosis of that um, really uh, ahead of the game there. Yes. So far as everything we did in the last. Further discussion. Well, I guess have we already thanked the the wise electorate of International Falls for supporting this. <laughs> I mean. I really appreciate their wisdom in moving this forward. That and the newspaper's editorial and the Chamber of Commerce and all. Uh, very, very helpful for. And I know our candidates were out there campaigning our, on behalf of And our of the radio district. station also. And yeah. <clears throat> well, it was a group effort. Thank you. Further discussion? Question? Aye. 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 I would vote yes. Motion is carried. Resolution is adopted. Thank you. Item number six is the resolution approving the application for an exempt permit for the Chamber of Commerce to conduct a raffle as part of Icebox Day celebration drawing to be held Monday, January 21st, 2019. Uh, move. Me too. Okay, okay, second. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You win. Motion by Councillor Briggs, second by Councillor Droba. Up the resolution. Question? Discussion? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Aye. And I would vote yes. Motion is carried. Resolution is adopted. Thank you. Any other business? Under new business? We'll move to the reports of boards, committees, and department heads. City Administrator. Mr. Mayor, just two things briefly. I, I wanted to uh, draw the council's attention to uh, a couple of photos I took of the Donahue site in the parking lot that the city got, uh, had completed this fall. You can see that the new monument that was part of the agreement was installed and uh, tried to take a picture, but it doesn't show up very well in the re copy uh, photo, but I've included two pictures where you can see the handicapped parking sign in the back and the monument in the foreground and then a, another view of the entire parking lot. So I just wanted you to know that that work has been completed. And then the second uh, piece of information is I received an email uh, late last week and uh, we participate with the Northeast Service Cooperative in providing um, insurance here. Um, they, each program here, they do a settlement analysis and, and look at different criteria and then we qualified for a premium refund. 
And uh, so we expect in the next couple of weeks to receive a check in the amount of $6,244.98 from the finance department um, at the Northeast. So that's good news, and I think we're the only participating entity in the cooperative that received a um, a premium this year. So uh, we don't have anything further. Very good news. Thank you. Questions for the city administrator? Thank you. We'll move to the city attorney. Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, along with... Uh, uh, Mr. Anderson's comments uh, with regard to the Donahue property. Uh, I've been communicating with Matt and the Donahue family is very pleased uh, that this is now uh, uh, near completion. Uh, we did receive, I did receive this morning and, and gave it to uh, uh, City Administrator Anderson uh, the final $2,500 contribution that the Donahue family made to the costs of doing this uh, and they'd given us $2,500 earlier. Uh, so um, it looks like we can uh, we have to connect the parking area uh, to the other trail uh, a short distance uh, but we're very close to having this project completed and we can start using it which will be nice that's all I have questions for the city attorney I hate even bringing it up, but um, as I understand it, the TP was purchased. They they followed through with the purchase at this point. Do we have any contract between us and them? No, they they moved forward between themselves without any additional uh, promises or agreements with the city, uh, and and they knew we would not be in a position to probably do anything until spring. I expect that we will hear back from uh, the owners, uh, but uh, they went ahead on their own without any participation by the city. Okay, just wanted to make sure that, that was the case. Thank you. Chief Maston, please. Mr. Mayor, Council, um, I have my October activity report for the police department. Um, for the month of October, we had 490 calls for service. 176 traffic stops, issued 114 citations, 35 medical assists, 21 in custody arrests, and we generated 105 new cases. I attached all the uh, information along with the report on all, how all those calls and cases are broke down for your information. As far as training goes, we had our, uh, our, night, our night shoot training, firearms instruction. Um, I had opportunity to spend the last week at Camp Ripley uh, the last week of October at the Chief uh, Law Enforcement uh, Training Academy. It was uh, very informational and I'm uh, very glad that I was able to attend that. Sergeant Kostic and Officer Ellsbury participated in the Rainy River Community College Career Expo, meeting with uh, students from all around the area um, to discuss the law enforcement career field. Additionally, I'd point out that uh, Officer Ellsbury is conducting our DEER program this year. She started in, in the month of October, and with that, we've expanded that now as a experiment, if you will, into the 8th and 10th grade in an attempt to keep the kids more in touch with law enforcement and to have a little more law enforcement presence in the school. So uh, that seems to be going good so far. We'll see how it goes the rest of the year. Program, their program is with the sixth graders, but now we're, we've also expanded to the eighth and tenth grade. Right, and we're doing that with, uh, with the, in collaboration with uh, Cape Coalition. Slotinski has some funding to help us with that. Um, the curriculum is different than the eighth and the tenth, so uh, they continue to learn, but they learn uh, newer things as far as uh, up to date trends and, and issues that are. Uh, Thank you. Further uh, questions for uh, Chief Maston? Mayor. Please. I just want to say that I think it's noteworthy that the uh, police department is taking the initiative to uh, attend the Career Expo at Rainy River Community College and try and generate interest in law enforcement careers uh, with younger people and students. Um, you know, we've talked on and off through KEDA and through our Economic Development Authority and just uh, the, we heard it tonight about the nursing program. 
finding enough students to fill the jobs is very difficult. And it's not a problem isolated to International Falls or Kuchichin County. It's a statewide and it's a nationwide problem just because of the demographics. And so anything that we can do to generate interest in some of the positions that we have should be commended and reported. And I think we need to think outside the envelope uh, and outside the box to try and uh, generate more interest in not only law enforcement careers, but anything else. That that's all the good. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you, Chief, for a great report. Chief Manasa, anything? Uh, nothing to report this time, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we go to reports of the Mayor, Council Committees, Boards, and Commissions. Councilor Droba. I, uh, I just know that we, we just had our election in the the great people of International Falls and Kuchin County thought I was doing such a great job. They wanted to keep me here for another two years, so I'm super excited about that. Um, but in January, we're gonna be having a lot of turnover on our boards and commissions, and I was wondering if uh, we want to advertise that we have openings. We talk about it every year, but we usually talk about it in January when we have the openings. So, you know, here we are at the end of November if we wanted to advertise that we have positions available on the Charter Commission, the Cable Commission. I think we need to eliminate the Donahue Committee, probably our EDA Advisory Board because we haven't met in three years. Um, there's one on the... Uh, Housing and Redevelopment, the Library Board has two, North Cooch Sanitary District has two, the Planning Commission has three. Um, so, I mean, we have a lot of openings that come up in January, and I didn't know if we wanted to just let people know that you can look at our web website to see what uh, what is available or specifically put it out of what is available, but I think that we want to get as many people involved in our community as possible, and this is a way to get people to serve, to come up the, the ranks. We want, we want younger people, we want new people involved in our government, so this is an opportunity, and we have a lot of the same people on a lot of the different boards, um, and it's just a thought if we wanted to advertise for that. I think it's a very good thought, and we need to do it, and we need to do it now, so um, can we... I would direct, I would make a motion then, that we direct our administrator to draw up an ad, get it in the paper, list all of the positions. The applications are open now, as soon as you get, you know, work out the details, but we need to move ahead. And ultimately, it still comes down to an appointment. I mean, the mayor still has an appointment, but I do know that there that we as a city council have had frustrations with some of our committees not meeting. We've had issues and uh, conversations of some of our committees not uh, having the city's interests best at heart. And I think if there is going to be um, turnover, if there is going to be change, we need to have people actually apply for the positions and know that they're available. And it gives people time to ask questions and contact us. Maybe as part of that ad, we should put for information, contact any one of your representative counselors. I mean, we, could, we can all speak to some of the issues that are going on in those various committees. And I will add that uh, a number of folks have already that are serving have already uh, sent me letters or uh, contacted me about continuing to serve. So I just want to make make that known also. And they've done a, they've done a good job and they've attended meetings and and so uh, certainly we'll be uh, doing all of that. Well, and that's always at the discretion of the mayor. He, you make the appointments. We've had that issue. Yes. We've had that conversation in the past. It's not our job as city councilors to argue who the mayor chooses to or not to, it's to, to verify the worthiness of those that have been appointed, so. I think in addition to your uh, list of, of um, ones that aren't uh, operating, I don't think the Cable Commission is operating. Um, I don't think they're, they're I haven't, we haven't that's met. We not, don't have not functioning, so. Yeah. 
And I just went through our website. But, but they, uh, folks might go to the website and, and uh, take a look at... Uh, I did get a communication that I copied you on regarding an issue with MIDPO, but the committee's not meeting. Okay. Second. Okay, motion by Councillor Jacksaw, second by Councillor Kraus to advertise uh, board and commission openings. Question? Question? Aye. 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 Yes, motion is carried. Things on boards and commission will be advertised. Thank you. Further under boards and commissions, council committees. Uh, you have my report. Uh, the only uh, item coming up is the uh, Highway 53 meeting at Cook, and uh, plan to be there for that. Uh, as chair and uh, housing task meeting. force. Housing, task the housing meeting is on the 26th, I think. On Monday? Okay. 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock. And is that at Bacchus again? 10 to 11.30 at Bacchus, that's correct. Okay. Because I did have a call on that today also. Right? Okay. One in the audience that wishes to bring something to the attention of the council? Not uh, note the correspondence. The next regular council meeting is Monday, December the third. At that time, we will also have the Truth and Taxation Public Hearing and Input Meeting at 6 p.m. Nothing further to come before the council this evening. We'll stand adjourned.